look, the fact was, whatever Mark Shapiro did or whoever he was, he wasn't going to be liked because he was replaced in the other guys and the other guys were suddenly heroes. I think he's misunderstood. I think people haven't been willing to try and find out who he is and what he's all about. He's very smart. He's very good at what he does, but he is not beloved in the city where he runs a ball club. And I'm not sure that he ever will be no matter what happens. I think even if they succeed, someone else is gonna get the credit. But a fascinating guy to talk to for those reasons. He's, you know, he's aware, he's aware of his circumstance. I don't think he wants sympathy, um, but I think, I think on some level, he would like people to understand who he is and what he's trying to do. Why can't you just tell him? Tell him the truth, tell him about this player, tell him why you did this. Mark, what's it like coming off? I was, like, I know this, you, you knew this year was going to be not about wins and losses, it's going to be about something else this year, but you're a competitive guy, right? Yeah. What's, like, watching your team lose almost 100 times has got to be yeah. hard. Uh, moments, you know, moments are hard within that. Um, I think what you try to do when you go through a season like this is dissect the games, you know, what is meaningful within a game to the team we're ultimately going to be. Uh, what is not meaningful. So an example of that would be you've got a game where you compete, and this has happened over the last 50, last 50, 55 games of the season, played the toughest schedule in Major League Baseball. We've been in almost every single game, been one of the more competitive teams, and we've been a little less than 500, so we've lost a lot of games. Within those games, you think about what was pertinent to the team that we're going to be when we're a championship team. And I get that. Like, I can, I take in the long view, right, because yeah. that's what... But are there nights, like, do you take it home with you sometimes? Do you ever go home and just say, man, oh, man, that's... So you try to go through, I think, again, knowing that I can tell you that uh, having been through a couple of rebuilds, the first time I went through it, I absolutely took it home with me. You know, I, it was, uh, I'd walk downstairs and anyone in my family could look at my face and regardless of how well I thought I was hiding it, they would know 100% the night before, you know, uh, you. exactly how we did. Thank you. Um, but I think at a certain period of time, trying to determine, like, is this a sustainable career? You know, can I maintain energy? Can I maintain my drive? Can I maintain who I am as a leader? And that's, that's really the most important thing. Like, I've got to think about, one, who I am as a father, you know, and a friend. And, you know, but I've also got to think about who I am as a leader. So players, coaching staff people that work for the team, people that work for us in Dunedin and elsewhere, they're going to look and see how does Ross react? How does Charlie Montoya react? How is Mark reacting? So I think regardless of how you feel internally, you've got to figure out a way to authentically and genuinely manage those emotions uh, and ensure that you're, okay, I, I felt, you know, bitter. You know, I've got to let that go. I've got to get back. What can I control? You know, focus on controlling the controllable. What can I control? Because I will ultimately feel better when I get back to working, when I get back to, to actively controlling what I can control to help move us towards a championship team. When I wallow in the loss, when I think, you know, when I get bitter, it's only during the game, Stephen, because once the game's over, I'm back to, okay, what can I control? What can I do to speed it up? What can I do to help us? You know, what are the things we can do to get better? And that's what I tend to focus on. You know, you said, you're like, you, you, I, I, I know, People probably realize you've been through this a couple of times in Cleveland, right? And, um, and including all the slings and arrows, like you've been through that part. But <laughs> is this... I've got the scars to show. You, yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you might have a couple more before this is done. And now I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you and welcome to the stage Mark Shapiro, President and CEO of the Toronto Blue Jays and Rogers Center. You know, I think I was, I was probably, it was it's four years, which is pretty amazing. I can't, I can't uh, the time has flown, but, um, and I think I was one of the first people to sit down with you here oh, you, when you got you to town. first. Maybe I was yeah. the first. <laughs> what, you know, you, and, and look, you were a bit of a stranger in a strange land at that point. It was a, you know, and you were walking into a particular emotional dynamic in this city, to say the yeah. least, a remarkable emotional dynamic, which was, wasn't necessarily something you could have anticipated, but, Mark, what have, you, what have you figured out about this place in those four years? I, you know, the largest things I've figured out are an affirmation of what drove us to come here. You know, just the, the city is incredible. Um, it is 
It's incredibly diverse. It is very progressive. It is open-minded in a lot of ways. Um, compassionate, you know, and just a, I think in, in the world that we live in now, an incredible place to be and a great time to be here. Um, from a business lens, you know, it is booming. You know, it is growing. Uh, the economy is vibrant, healthy, and deep. Um, and then there's the national dynamic, which to me was certainly clear but abstract to some extent. So now being able to actually live that, to see what happens when we go to Vancouver, to know what happens when we you know, travel in the off season to different locations as part of a winter tour. Um, so the the things that felt like were draws are, are actually more of a reality and an affirmation like of, of, of reasons to be here. Um, certainly some of the things that go with a robust market, you know, a challenging media environment, you know, um, education for me, how probably unprepared I was to emotionally maybe, not equipped professionally, but emotionally to deal with that. That's certainly something I hadn't dealt with. I've been in a sleepy little Cleveland, Ohio for my whole career and, you know, it's three beat writers and you know, one and a half newspapers and one radio, you know, not, there's not a whole lot of attention. So it's, it's a different game here. Um, watching Ross have to deal with that and Charlie have to deal with that day in, day out, you know, and then knowing that it's also part of the backdrop of, and wanting it to be more positive, but understanding that, you know, people gravitate towards negativity and that's just the way that it goes. So. Is that um, tough though to, you know, because as you say, you can't, you know, Cleveland is a one newspaper town, you know, you didn't have nearly the kind of media pressure you have here. Um, and there has been loads of criticism, you know, fair or un fairly or unfairly. Um, letting that stuff roll off your back, is that, so, is that a hard thing to so do? So this is authentic and genuine. The criticism is not tough. That's just, I mean, it's part of it, you know. Like, if you can't handle the criticism, if you're not sure of who you are as a person. What if you don't think it's fair, though, Mark? So this is where the line is, right? The, the negativity is tough. Um, thank you. The negativity is tough. Um, the criticism is not tough. So when you're feeling positive, when you're feeling good about the direction, when you think there are so many reasons to believe that good things are going to happen and you want your fans, who are ultimately who you're doing it for, to get that message and you know your mouthpiece to the fans is through the media and that's not translating, that's not coming through, that's tough, that's frustrating, you know, that can be challenging. But again, what I get back to is you gotta get results. Like, you know, like the only thing that's gonna ultimately satisfy in the end. So what you do is you take that frustration, um, you take that, you know, those tough moments and you channel that to, okay, urgency. Mm -hmm. We gotta win. Like anything short of that is, you know, don't spend energy being disappointed, don't spend energy worrying about, you know, garnering approval along the way. It's clear we're not going to get that, or we're clear we're going to get that in limited doses, although I think that's starting to turn to some extent. So. But again, you're talking, you know, again, that's, and that, again, I understand, and you're, that is, again, taking the long view, right, saying that the way this turns, if you win, then... I'm not sure it's the long view. I think it's the only way for preservation. I mean, I just can't, like, if you spend your time trying to figure out, first of all, it's also inefficient, Stephen. Like genuinely, if I'm, sure. if I'm spending energy trying to figure out, my, I'm going to spend 70% of my day trying to convince Stephen Brunt that we're going to that we're going to be a good team someday, and we're doing all the right things necessary to win, and we dealt with the challenges that are in place, and there's strategy and plans in place to win, and that's instead of building those strategies and executing on those plans, then we are. 50% as good as we should be, you know, and regardless of whether I convince you or not, we just lost time. So I mean, I used to, I go back to, you know, one of my best friends, Scott Pioli, used to say, somebody's beating you. If I'm spending my time on what we shouldn't be spending our time on, then somebody's beating us. So we've got to get back to focusing on what, you know, is going to get us there. And I get that. I really do. But uh, look, I hate uh, like I, my job is a public job to a degree. Um, I stay away from social media intentionally for a lot of reasons. Um, but I don't like it when someone takes a shot at me. I don't enjoy yeah. that, and I, especially if I don't think it's fair. And, I, and, it, and it eats at me. Like I, I admit it, right? It bugs me, and, and I maybe don't let it go immediately. Um, and, I, and again, I can, I can come up with a good rational reason why I shouldn't care. Yeah. But I still care to some degree. Do you, like, isn't there a part of you in your gut where you go, man, that's... Man, I, you know, I, 
I think the only time that it gets me is when I see how it impacts my son, because my daughter doesn't care at all. But when I see his level of frustration and him saying, why can't you just tell him? Tell him the truth. Tell him about this player. Tell him why you did this. And you, why can't you just come out and be open and honest? And why can't you just explain what happened? And, you know, like that, you know, that I, when I see how it's impacting him sometimes, that's the only time. I mean, honestly, look back, like, you've got to understand the history. You know, 2001, 2002, you know, I walked into a situation where we had won for eight straight years. Eight. Playoffs, seven of eight years, two AL championships, not ALCS appearances, AL championships. And I was the guy that came in. I was there for all that. But I, when I got my opportunity to be GM, I was the guy that had to dismantle that and turn the entire team over and get it back to contention with less resources in a tougher environment. And I had threats. I had levels of criticism that were personal. I had all kinds of attacks. And I don't know. Like, I just at some point, like, okay, no problem. Like, bring it on. Like, I, I kind of, like, that's... Do you embrace the fight part of it? Like, do you, are you maybe a, a scrapper that's, maybe that way? That, like, maybe that's it. I don't know. Like, I just, like, that fuels me. Like, you know, like, I'm, I want a challenging situation. Like, I'm a builder by nature. I want to I wanna build something special. I focus my energy on the people around me that I care about. You know, those are a lot of people I work with. And wanting them to be strong and believe and those situations, I mean, I'm <clears throat> not the most gifted, I'm not the smartest, was never the most athletic, um, but, you know, I'm among the toughest, you know, like, it's going to be hard, you're going to have a hard time, if you want to knock me down, you know, you can probably knock me down, but I'm going to probably get back up again, so I'm fueled by that, you know, I'm fueled by being tougher than someone else, I'm fueled by persevering, I'm fueled by, you know, wanting to be ultimately to get it right in the end and I want ultimately again for the fans to for them to enjoy it so um, what helps me get through the the criticism is just not thinking about the praise at the times I've had praise because we, we haven't talked about that but the times that you've had praise in your career you don't dwell on that you let that go is, is there an element of I told you so at all though again never, I know you don't do it never but. I got asked that when we when we finally turned it around and won in Cleveland yeah. and, and media was asking me all the time do you feel vindicated and I was like I'm not even spending a second thinking about that I'm spending a second thinking about how do we keep it going yeah. That's it. Nothing else. But vindicated like, is a good feeling, i got to say, in, in I, life, isn't it? Like, isn't it good when you're right about something? That means you've, again, I think if you feel vindication, then you've given someone the power to crush you with the criticism or lift you with the praise. And I just choose to, again, it, it's very personal philosophy, and I know we're, we're trying to push, pull hard at those strings. It's, it doesn't, you don't get there easily. I didn't just, you know, wake up and I wasn't born this way, but as you evolve as an adult... You know, I, I just don't place my self-esteem in the hands of other people. Like, I, I can, you know, certainly moods can be impacted, swing, energy swings can go up and down, jobs can be taken away, you know, but my self-esteem, my self-worth, my, who I am as a human being, you can't, you're not going to touch it, you know. It's like that. those things are forged by my other roles in life. They're forged by a track record of how you live for 52 years, how you treat people, the relationships you build. Um, and the jobs you've done along the way, and I'm at peace with that. Like, I'm at peace with who I am. What's your off switch, then? What, what's, do you have one? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't really have one, you know? I guess it's the... The time I sleep. I mean, parenting is not necessarily for anyone that parents adolescents. I'm not sure that's an off switch. There. And you got two, te you got two teenage kids, yeah, right? Yeah, there so are you... moments. There are moments within that, you know, that uh, that feel like, you know, really incredibly meaningful, but not necessarily off because they're all the anxieties of trying to want them to have everything they want out of life and navigate through that minefield of kind of the becoming an adult so but is there you know like is, do you have a like hobby is the wrong word because it sounds like fishing. stamp stamp collecting <laughs> yeah like yeah something Someday like that i will I'll, yeah i'll get you <laughs> yeah. into that i'll get you into like yeah, yeah i like honest to god i kind of live to fly fish yeah you know, that's i kind of arranged my life so that and i can, i think i've talked about it with you like if yeah. i could pick one thing it would be fly fishing yeah, i've good. done that four or five times get you outdoors it's, you, and and you, it's have to, you have to be centered you have to be very like you have to you you have to be present 
you yes. know, and so. Um, but is there like you know great great food, great wine, travel? Uh, music. I mean, I like music. I like music. You know, like to the um, point where you'd go out to see a show at night. I would see not? a show, but not like not a ton. Of, I wouldn't just go randomly and like. But I would. There are people I would go to see. Um, who would you go see? Who? I mean, we always joke about like Springsteen's had such a, a you know a pivotal role in my life with the Jersey ties of the summer Jersey Shore with my siblings. It's just such a bond, but the Avet brothers I saw this yeah, summer, so I love them. So I mean, it just depends. Like I have pretty eclectic tastes, you know, all over the, all over the map, but, um, I, but when I think like when I'm trying to ponder what you're saying and, and relationships for me, mm -hmm. you know, kind of are my, I don't know if they're an off switch, but they're an energizer for me. And, and I have a, I have it, an introverted side to me where I need to kind of have some alone time to, mm -hmm. to rebuild my energy levels, but being part of watching people grow, develop, learn, creating an organization or an environment where people can become their best and providing them with opportunities and not, not guiding them, but empowering them. Um, I gain energy from those things. So to me, that I don't necessarily need an off switch. You know, I, I guess I'm looking for it's more the fuel switch than the off switch, yeah. right? Like, how do you energize? But like, when you leave here, so you leave, I don't know, do you, are you here, do you stay here for every game at home? Almost every game, yeah. I'm here for every game. There are games, you know, well, as, you I've, as I've switched from GM to president, there are games where I might, if it's a, an ugly outcome or I just have an early morning meeting, I might cut out a little bit early, but not much. Well, and what would, so if you go, when you get home, what, do you, what would you do? When I get home, I, I think, you know, it used to be I would stay up for a while and do some email. Um, so more and, of the same kind of yeah, right? but sometimes I might watch a show like you know turn on you know turn on Netflix or you know try to say okay I'm gonna watch Succession or just something to kind of decompress. But if it's late, um, you know then I'm gonna do the best I can to kind of maybe read an article, maybe do like one or two quick things, and then try to get to bed as quick as I can. So looking on and watching what happened here in August and September and October, it was is that sustainable? Was did you see that as something that was sustainable? Uh, I saw definitively as something that could have was more than a one-shot deal. If you could roll it back to four years ago when we were first sitting down and having a conversation like this, is there anything you'd change? Well, I don't tend to ever think like that. That's, you know? and I knew that was yeah, coming. Yeah, I, I don't, that's just not, that's not in my DNA. You know, I'm not wired to kind of think, oh, I wish I would have done that. I try, I try to learn from the things that we consider to be mistakes. So there certainly are decisions that, you know, if you had the knowledge of knowing how they turn out, you would do differently. You try to learn from how uh, those decisions would be different. But no, I mean, I think the biggest ones, which are the obvious ones, which would you have blown up the situation and kind of moved into rebuilding earlier? Um, I just spent some time talking about this. I think a lot of it gets written about trying to, you were trying to distance yourself from the last, gen, you know, from the 15 and 16 teams. and. Heck no, we, we, we clung to those teams, you know? Like, we saw the potential of winning on the landscape here, both nationally and locally, and, you know, we probably counterintuitively, counterintellectually, counterlogically, we did everything humanly possible to keep that window open, and, you know, that's made it a little bit tougher, you know, to kind of get where we're going, but I would do that again. Was the owner any part of that decision not to blow it up at that point? No, I mean, I, I am as fortunate as you can be being a baseball guy uh, with complete and total empowerment from an ownership group to make baseball decisions. Like those are not conversations we're having. We're certainly having conversations about what the plan is and what the strategy is. There's a lot of questions about what the timing of that looks like. Um, there certainly are budget questions, which anyone that runs a business would expect that you're accountable for profit and loss. Um, and there's, you know, a desire to understand and support. Uh, but when it comes to baseball decisions, trades, free agent signs, managerial decisions, there are baseball people being empowered 100% to make those decisions. So no one gets involved at that level and says, hang on, you know, we the TV ratings matter here. Let's no, tap the brakes a little bit. Those conversations 110% have never been had. Only support. Okay, I want to I ask you, and maybe this is maybe this we can, and I'm going to give you an impossible question because I know, but it's heck, what the heck, eh? <laughs> Occasionally, you know, again with all of the the churn and the conversation around the team and around um, the front office and around everything, you know, people occasionally speculate about whether you're going to stick around, yeah. right? They say, well, maybe 
you know, he's going to leave somewhere by choice, or maybe, maybe some point he won't leave by choice. Maybe there's uh, there's that contract will come up, and then yeah. eventually it happens to everybody. We all, in a, cos in a cosmic sense, we all leave. Yeah, don't I've leave by choice either, right? Yeah, I've been that happened in my career yet, yeah. but I live with the reality. That's just part of it. Are you are you happy here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think I feel fortunate to wake up, and that's an easy question. You know, I can answer that quickly and wholeheartedly. Um, feel fortunate to wake up and work with the people I work with. Feel fortunate to wake up in the city, you know, that I wake up in and I feel fortunate to do the job that I do. I mean, that's three pretty big things to help you feel fulfilled and, and happy. So I wake up excited to attack it every day. But what about, and again, I, and again, maybe this is, maybe this is also impossible, but um, you're an ambitious guy, you know, you, you, um, and maybe you didn't see this step coming when you were in Cleveland immediately, or you know, when it happened, um, this job came open at a certain point. Do you, it, it, this isn't where it ends though, is it? For you, career-wise? Um, so this is, this is an honest answer to that. So A, what you said, no. I mean, I didn't know exactly what this would be. You and I, this, that's, that's the history. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it was different when six months after I took it than I expected it to be, you know, when, when I took it. But that, I just accepted that. That, okay, that's what it is. Let's go, you know. Um, I never, when I was an entry-level cubicle dweller in Cleveland, you know, with no title, I never thought I'm not going to be happy unless I'm a farm director. And when I was a farm director, I never thought I got to be an assistant GM. You know, when I was assistant GM, I never thought I got to be a GM. And when I was a GM, I never thought, I just thought I love leading. I like the platform to lead. I want to impact people's lives positively. I love that. That's something that's important to me. Hey, good seeing you again. All right, good yeah, to see cheers. you. Yeah, cheers. Let's, uh, let's cheers. finish this. Let's have our meal. Cheers. cheers.